The Economist. Hello and welcome to The Intelligence from The Economist. I'm Rosie Bloor. And I'm Jason Palmer. Every weekday, we provide a fresh perspective on the events shaping your world. Drones have been a crucial weapon in Ukraine's fight against Russia. Our correspondent went to meet the commander in charge of that drone army and discovered his surprising backstory. And I wish we weren't back in this doom loop of fact-checking Donald Trump's more outlandish claims. But some just leave you with too many questions. So, illegal immigrants are eating the pets of the good people of Ohio, eh? Let's look into that. First up, though. Silicon Valley wouldn't be what it is without a few companies that made it a global byword for tech innovation. Intel was one of the earliest and arguably had the greatest reach. It's the company that made the first processor that fit on a single chip, and later the chips in untold numbers of a new gizmo called the personal computer. For a long while there, America's whole innovation story had Intel inside. It was a national champion. It was a corporate embodiment of the country's technological dominance. In the long run, what it wasn't was nimble. Intel is in an incredibly precarious position. Jan Petrovsky is our newly minted writer of Schumpeter, our column on global business, having previously been our business editor. It has gone from being the undisputed champion of the semiconductor industry up until the early 2000s to an absolute shadow of its former self. It is, to be frank, teetering on the brink of collapse. So what do you mean exactly? What, what is it that's gone wrong or is going wrong for Intel? Well, it has had trouble for a while, but most recently it was absolutely clobbered by investors after it reported incredibly disappointing quarterly results in early August. It made a net loss of about one and a half billion dollars. This led CEO Pat Gelsinger to announce deep job cuts of about 15,000 people or about 15% of the workforce, cuts to its capital spending, which was meant to bolster its manufacturing ambitions, and other cost-saving measures, which probably do not cut deep enough. And so how much of that position is at the feet of, of the chief executive, Mr. Gelsinger? So certainly not all of it, and in fact, probably not even the bulk of it. So Intel has had a problem for a while because its previous management, which was basically a string of accountant CEOs, missed several big changes which were completely reshaping the semiconductor industry. And this started in the late 2000s when a lot of computing went from PCs, which is Intel's forte, to mobile phones, which wasn't and still isn't. Then management didn't quite notice the industry structure was moving away from integrated companies, which both design and manufacture chips, like Intel, to a disaggregated model where you have specialist chip design firms outsource manufacturing to specialist foundries like TSMC of Taiwan. The next problem was basically a series of manufacturing slip-ups, which meant that Intel's processors were delayed and that gave AMD, which is an American designer rival, which works in tandem with TSMC, to steal market share from Intel. And then most recently, Intel completely missed the boat on the big shift of computing in the cloud from central processing units of the sort that it has been selling for a very long time to graphics processing units which undergird the AI boom as well. Okay, so this wasn't the boss's fault. This has been brewing for really quite some time, but did he have a plan or or an explanation? So he definitely had a plan. So unlike the accountant CEOs I mentioned, he's actually a true-blooded technologist. He actually served as Intel's chief technology officer before moving on to a cloud software firm to run it for a few years. So he was brought back as a technologist and... 
His original plan was sort of on paper quite sensible, and it involved segmenting Intel into, in effect, two large business units. A fabulous design studio, a bit like AMD or NVIDIA, which is the big beast of AI chip making, on the one hand, and on the other hand, Intel Foundry services. So something like a TSMC, which could take orders not just from Intel's in-house designers, but also from other design firms keen to get their chips manufactured. And now that all sort of on paper made sense. Unfortunately, it took for granted two things. One was Intel's ability to keep making a fair amount of money from its core business of selling central processing units, CPUs, and two, its ability to quickly catch up with TSMC on cutting-edge manufacturing, where Intel was behind because of all those manufacturing blunders I mentioned earlier. And it turns out that on both these counts, Mr. Gelsinger was just overly optimistic. So what now for him then? I mean, he seemingly needs to change course. Yes, he's expected to present a revised turnaround plan on top of the cuts he announced in early August. And this is meant to be presented to the board this week. We don't know exactly when. Most Intel watchers expect some combination of more layoffs, maybe the sale of one or two peripheral businesses, and maybe even the shelving of plans for a very large chip factory in Germany. And would that do it? Is that the the scale of turnaround that Intel needs, do you think? Almost certainly not. So to your mind then, Intel is already doomed to be an also-ran of this technological era, to be this decade's Nokia. Well, it can't quite be this decade's Nokia, and this is where the true drama and tragedy of Intel really shows up. So if Nokia died, there are plenty of other mobile phone companies that would offer a pretty much similar product. It didn't matter that Nokia died. It would matter greatly if Intel died. And that is for two reasons. The commercial reason is that it would leave all cutting edge chip making in the hands of TSMC, which would then become a monopolist. And monopolists don't tend to treat their customers terribly well. And secondly, there is geopolitics and there is a non-zero chance that China invades Taiwan and TSMC falls victim to war, in which case even TSMC's fabs in America, which it is building, would probably suffer because most of its expertise still resides in Taiwan. So Intel, in other words, pretty much has to survive. So what would Intel need to do to survive? There are three options. Either Gelsinger's more cautious plan works, Either its customers come in and realize that they need Intel to stay alive, or you get Uncle Sam to step in and bail it out. The American government is already giving it several billion dollars in support through the CHIPS Act, but it would be bad for taxpayers and ultimately might also be bad for the customers because it would leave them in hock to a company that is itself in hock to America's government, which is not an ideal place to be in a fast-moving technology industry. So Intel is probably going to stay alive, but there are better ways of keeping it alive than others. Jan, thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Jason. This was a pleasure. Vadim Sukarevsky was installed as the head of Ukraine's unmanned systems forces this summer. It's the first position of its kind anywhere in the world, and it's one that's likely to gain even more significance. Oliver Carroll is The Economist's Ukraine correspondent. And it's not Sukarevsky's first time on the front row of history. He's got it's fair to say, legendary status as the first Ukrainian commanders to shoot back at the Russians at a time when they were staging a proxy war in the Donbass in 2014. He was a lieutenant at the time in Slovensk, the sleepy epicenter of the war back then. He was commanding a paratrooper unit 
And when his troops were threatened with an ambush by essentially Russian special forces under the control of the rebel commander Igor Zdrokov Gerkin, he opened fire, despite there being a very clear order not to. His quick thinking probably saved a dozen of his men. And those first Ukrainian bullets were a good two days before the official start of Ukraine's anti-terrorist operation, as it was then known. See it, shoot it became his motto, and he carried that through his military career. Oli, disobeying orders doesn't normally get you a promotion. So what happened next? Right, now he's the leader of Ukraine's unmanned systems forces, essentially its drone army, a position which really couldn't be more important. And even if the war moves into a new phase, it's exactly here in the innovation of drones that the world will be looking. But his backstory is very much of a rebel, a rebel with initiative. We were talking over a couple of evenings in Kiev, and he was telling me about his start in Transcarpathia, which is a western region of Ukraine, quite known for its criminality and smuggling. When he was young, he would either find them in the library, in the gym, or in a fight. So you come into his office, and for someone you really expect to be in this glitzy command center, it's actually quite a shock to see wires on the floor. He's got an extensive collection of daggers, Warhammer models, which he says he glues together in the spare evenings. He's smoking shish tobacco. There's a record player in the corner. And he's there in the middle, turning around in this gaming chair, which has his motto, see it, shoot it. He really leans into the romantic side of the military, this kind of modern-day Cossack hetman. But he's got where he's got to, because over the years, he's shown decisiveness, beginning at that moment back in 2014, but also continuing all the way through. His units have been known for their technological prowess, their ability to use jamming solutions and drone solutions to keep soldiers much safer than the average soldier in the Ukrainian army. And he was noticed, and a lot of people were lobbying for his appointment, and eventually the people at the top gave way, and he has this opportunity now to shine. And what did you learn about Ukraine's current capabilities from him? Well, Ukraine saw drones as a way of getting asymmetric advantage. So Russia from the very start of the war was much better resourced in terms of missiles, in terms of armor. And this was a way that Ukraine managed to eke out some small tactical advantages on the battlefield. It was an early adopter of FPV technology, these small drones being piloted by people often far away from the battlefield. And they really pushed that forward thanks in the main to voluntary contributions and Ukrainians themselves basically paying for these drones. But Russia has the advantage of up-down scale and production capacity. And at the moment, as Colonel Sukhoresky told me, they're now at a six-to-one advantage. Sukhoresky still thinks that Ukraine's horizontal approach, its diversity, is an advantage. But what it means is they have to be very, very quick with their feedback loops. They have to keep innovating very, very quickly to stay ahead of this huge juggernaut of Russian military industrial capacity. He said Ukraine is the outpost standing between the civilized and the authoritarian world. In some ways, he seems like a microcosm of what we've seen from Ukraine, someone with an unusual background coming to the fore and using his ingenuity to push forwards. What do you think we can now see from him and from Ukraine about what the future will hold? Certainly, he does demonstrate one side of Ukrainian scrappiness and ingenuity, the push to diversify methods. So a lot of the more innovative people in the army have put a lot of hope in him. He's very much the sort of embodiment of a tension inside the Ukrainian army between the Soviet style of command, which certainly exists and is predominant in certain areas of the army, and a new, more adaptable mindset of commanders who basically look to gain advantage in whichever way they can. You know, Ukraine still has huge resource problems, and Colonel Sukhorevsky still believes, at least in this war, that drones will remain as a support alongside infantry, alongside artillery, 
all the traditional elements of combined arms warfare. But what he says he wants the drones to do is to provide the ability to strike further with greater accuracy, at cheaper cost and at greater safety to soldiers. So we're still a long way from this imagined killer drone swarms, which we sometimes hear about, he says. He still thinks drones will be a complement and the role of AI as well still pretty minimal. And he says it will be a long time before he would relinquish control of any force, even unmanned to artificial intelligence. We've seen so much about drone warfare in Ukraine. As you say, Ukraine's initial dominance and then Russia catching up. What do you think is the future in terms of either side getting an edge? At the moment, Ukraine doesn't have the funds to develop how it wants to. So I think the message Colonel Sukarevsky was trying to get across to me was he was very aware of that side of things. And his message was Ukraine at the moment is fighting this battle almost on its own. They're working from day to day, trying to keep the front lines, using these various methods of jamming and new types of drones and so on. But they're looking for direction from the West. They're looking for NATO and the Western world to come up with a strategy for victory. Because at the moment, it does, at least to their eyes, seem that Ukraine is pulling together the scraps that it has. And it's not really clear if it's going to be enough in the end. Oli, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. So about 30 minutes into the debate on Tuesday night between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, maybe like me, you were tuning out at that point. There were a lot of canned lines being exchanged back and forth. Annie Crabill is a U.S. news editor for The Economist. But then something may have caught your attention, something that didn't quite fit. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating they're eating the pets of the people that live there. And he was promptly fact-checked by one of the moderators. I just want to clarify here, you bring up Springfield, uh, Ohio, and ABC News did reach out to the city manager there. Uh, he told us there had been no credible reports of specific claims of pets being harmed, injured, or abused by individuals within the immigrant community. Well, All I've this, seen people on television. Let me just say here, this is the... Most viewers probably had no idea what he was talking about. But for some people who are steeped in right-wing media, they knew exactly where he was going with it. This has actually been an issue that's been bubbling up for at least a couple of days and depending on how you look at it, over the course of the past year even. Okay, but first of all, let's set the scene a little bit. Tell me about Springfield. Springfield is a pretty small town in Ohio, just west of Columbus. So it has just over 58,000 residents as of the last census, which was in 2020. Since then, they have seen a dramatic influx in migrants from Haiti. There is an estimated 15 to 20,000 people from Haiti who have moved to this town. They seem to have been attracted by jobs. And then more recently, as is often the case, family networks encourage more people to move there. One thing to note is that Donald Trump and some other Republicans have said that they're illegal migrants, but that's actually not true. Most Haitians are able to work in this country under a temporary right to work scheme. So a lot of them have social security cards, they pay taxes, and they're entitled to benefits. Still, though, 15,000, 20,000 people moving into a small town is a big change. It's definitely a lot of people. So before the pandemic in the mid-2010s, Springfield was a classic Rust Belt declining town. It was losing its population. Its population was getting older. And so Springfield actually developed a strategic business development plan, and they really tried to make themselves attractive to investment. And they managed to attract some manufacturers there. And so there actually are now a good number of manufacturing jobs. And by all accounts, these Haitian migrants have been willing to fill those jobs. In a lot of cases, locals haven't been willing to. So there's plenty of employment. There are a lot of issues too, though. So like a lot of towns in America, Springfield has a housing shortage. 
And the increased demand from the influx of migrants has meant that housing prices have gone way up. There's also increased demand on social services. Some healthcare services, for instance, have seen increased wait times. There's been additional need to hire translators at some of those healthcare services or in schools. So other than those effects on budget or social services, there was an incident last August in which a Haitian man who was driving a minivan crashed into a school bus and an 11-year-old boy died. The driver did not have a U.S. driving license. He had a foreign driving license. And so road safety and familiarity with U.S. traffic laws or roads has been a bit of a sticking point since that incident and has really increased tensions in the town over this influx of migrants. Sure, increased tensions and fair enough, but I'm still unclear on how we get to eating pets. Okay, so right, maybe it's important to just say (laughs) clearly too that these allegations are unfounded. The Springfield police have said they received no credible reports of anyone killing or eating pets. But... Where did this come from? So seems to have been a couple of Facebook posts. In a Springfield Facebook group, one post said that a, quote, neighbor's daughter's friend had heard about or seen someone from Haiti killing and eating a cat. J.D. Vance, a senator from Ohio, as well as Donald Trump's running mate, on Monday tweeted to his massive online following that he has heard about reports of migrants in Springfield eating pets. This was then further amplified by Elon Musk, who is the owner of X, the Republican House Judiciary Committee's official Twitter posted an AI-generated image of Donald Trump with his arms around a kitten and a duck. So it seems like it was a couple of third-hand, fourth-hand accounts online that then were really amplified on right-wing social media. I mean, it's just a tiny slice of the craziness that's out there online. I mean, what does it tell you that this is the bit of the media cesspool that Mr. Trump has decided to pick out? I think it was telling of this gulf that we have in media ecosystems. So when Trump deploys these bizarre allegations about immigrants eating pets, maybe to a lot of his base, like they know exactly what he's talking about and they are pumped to hear him saying these things. It gets to how steeped he is and maybe how steeped a lot of his base is in some of these wilder conspiracy theories. And then the second you zoom out, you're sort of like, okay, I'm just not confident this is a winning political strategy. For a lot of viewers of the debate, and you know, you have to imagine that to some extent, the goal for both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris is to win over those undecided voters who are still making up their minds a couple months out from the election. It's hard to imagine that these sorts of conspiracy theories would help his case with those sorts of voters. Annie, thanks very much for walking us through the weirdness. Thank you for having me. That's all for this episode of The Intelligence. Let us know what you think of the show. You can get in touch at podcast.economist.com. We'll see you back here tomorrow. 